Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this morning and this chance and opportunity, Lord, to just uh, see you, Lord, through your word, um, to hear from you from your word. As we've, we've all gathered here together with different things going on in our lives, Lord, um, different distractions, different burdens, Lord, I pray that we would forget those things and look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, as, as you have, you have, we know you're dwelling among us this morning through your Holy Spirit, that um, he is desiring to teach us things, show us things in your word. Lord, I pray you would open up your word to us and that we would leave here closer to you than we were when we came. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Ephesians chapter 1, last week um, you guys were troopers and we read the whole book of Ephesians um, in one sitting um, and uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I kind of humbly bragged this past week to come, a couple of my pastor friends and they said, what you read? I was like, I did and they were great, you know. Um, the congregate, you know, I don't think anyone fell asleep. I don't know, I was reading so I couldn't look up. Um, so if you did fall asleep, you got lucky because um, I didn't see it. But um, we read through the whole book of Ephesians. We got to read every verse that Paul wrote to this church in Ephesus. Um, and we got to see what his main heart was behind this book. Now this morning we're going to get in just to the introduction of this book. Just the first 14 verses of what Paul has to say. Um, and again, this is not how they read it. How we read it last week is how the church in Ephesus and the churches in that area read it when they got the letter. They didn't read a couple verses and then say, all right, next week we'll, we'll be back and read the next couple lines. And then next week we'll read the next couple lines because we're doing a series on the Paul letters. Now, when Paul wrote them a letter, they were devouring that thing, understanding it. Um, but we've done that, and now I think we're going to go back. And, uh, you know, we've seen the forest. Now we're going to look at every single tree and see what's in there because um, there is a lot that Paul has in here. Now, in this introduction, um, when we read it, you might think that what Paul is saying here, and, and what you've probably heard, you've probably gotten letters in the mail, you've probably seen stuff on TV, pop-ups on your computer, about get-rich-quick scams, right? All you have to do is, you know, it, it, it's the, the prince in Nigeria who you send him $100 so he can be freed from prison, and he guarantees you $3 million dollars to, you know, from his fortune, but he needs your money now um, in order to be freed. Um, and, and we know that's just a scam. That's a get-rich-quick, um, you know, pyramid scheme, whatever it might be. And it certainly might seem that way because the way Paul describes what we have in Christ, our riches in Christ, he explains it as like, all you need to do is be found in Christ and you have all these riches available to you. But he's not just telling them, hey, you're rich, you're spoiled, good for you. I mean, we've seen, most of us in our life, and hopefully you're not one of them, we've seen um, spoiled kids growing up, right? They, see, there were rich kids who were spoiled and knew it. And then uh, I had friends who too were rich, but you would never know it. They weren't spoiled. They didn't really understand, even at an older age in high school, that their parents had money, um, because their parents were wise about it. And then there's the kids who are spoiled and, you know, uh, they, they think that dad has a built-in ATM into his closet um, and all you need to go is ask dad and he's, he's got that. Well, Paul is going to tell them, look, you know, we have abounding riches, but we're not going to be spoiled. We're not going to be that spoiled brat with those riches, taking advantage of what our father has given us what he has done. Instead, we're going to be wise. And he's going to tell them in um, this letter and, and starting here in this uh, introduction what that means for us moving forward. Okay, you found out you're rich. You know, uh, the, I remember when I was younger, the moment I found out kind of what money meant, um, what my parents, you know, what their financial si situation meant. And now that started to affect me. I realized it wasn't okay to just start, out, you know, ask my mom or dad for money all the time. Um, because it didn't grow on trees. Um, and so, uh, we're, Paul's going to tell them, okay, what does that mean to be rich in Christ? So verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints 
who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. From the beginning of this, we, we obviously know who wrote the letter. It was Paul. But we should take note of how he addresses himself and the people he is writing to. He calls himself an apostle. But notice what he says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. This is not a, by his own admission. He doesn't, which we have a lot of in nowadays. People love to call themselves apostles, prophets, um, all these different titles that they put in front of their names. Um, you know, if, uh, if you talk to some people and you don't put reverend or deacon or pastor in, in front of their first name, they are offended um, because they love that title. Um, Paul isn't doing this to, to you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, brag. It wasn't a humble brag. It wasn't brag at all. Because you know, as they'll show in this letter, this was something he was called to do. This was not something he earned. Um, he didn't go to school to become an apostle. Um, this was something the Lord had um, ordained for him to do. But it's by the will of God. And, and again, this kind of language that he has, this, this humility, um, this reverence for his calling... Uh, will be found throughout the letter. And then next, he calls the second part of verse 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus. He calls the people who he is writing to saints. Now this is written to a whole church. A whole church. Now, if we were to look around this morning at everyone in this room, by what our maybe preconceived notion of what a saint is, or maybe what a lot of other denominations or um, churches call a saint, I don't know if any of us would qualify <laughs> from their perspective. They wouldn't come to Calvary Chapel Savannah looking for saints. You know, they go see his big church there on Abercorn. Um, a beautiful church, that is, but um, the, the St. John the Baptist uh, cathedral over there, but for most of us, when we think of saints, we typically think of people in classical paintings that are very pious and left behind a great legacy of faith. You know, fair skin, curly flowing hair, um, usually like doing something for the poor or, or something like that, and um, very, you know, monotone face. Um, I mean, to be honest, it, doesn't, it didn't look fun to be a saint by the painting. <laughs> But Paul actually paints a different picture of what saints look like. He's writing to a whole church. These are new believers, mature believers. People who that night had just sinned. People who have, have never led anyone to Christ. People who have never gotten up and teach. People who have never performed a miracle. people that the world would think are the very opposite of saints. But Paul, what he's stating here in this opening line to them, to us, is that someone who is a saint is someone who is saved. Which would include the thief on the cross all the way to Paul himself. It's easy to call Paul a saint, right? I mean, he's already called an apostle. He's a pastor, a church planner. He wrote most of the New Testament. It's easy to call Paul a saint. In fact, in some church denominations, he is a saint. But from the world's view of who a saint is, it's, it's hard to look at someone like ourselves or the thief on the cross. In fact, I looked up um, what qualifies someone to be a saint in the Catholic Church. They have a whole process for someone to be considered a saint. First off, it, it can't, you can't even be considered till after you're dead, at least five years after you're dead. Kind of like a, the NFL Hall of Fame. You know, you have to be retired first and then. So it, you, it can't happen when you're alive. It has to be five years, and you have to submit it. Um, what actually your, your, your area past um, bishops have to kind of nominate you, and they send it off to a council who kind of looks it over. And what they do is they, they look over your life to make sure that you lived a pious life. You know, you didn't have any, like, open sins or anything like that. They looked at your writings because, I mean, back in those days people wrote, and, and you know, if it was nowadays, they'd probably look at your texts um, that you had given to everyone. 
And just to make sure that, you know, doctrinally you're sound, that you agree with the stuff that the church agrees with. Not usually what the Bible agrees with, but what the church agrees with. And then they want to look and see if you have miracles attested to you. You have to have at least two miracles attested to you. And then they kind of vote and say, oh, yeah, I think this guy, this guy or this gal could be a saint. In fact, the last time someone was uh, nominated a saint or was made a saint was in 1973, I believe it was. Um, so since then, in their eyes, there have been no more saints. But the Bible doesn't say that at all. The Bible clearly says that anyone who is saved is a saint. And a saint isn't someone, again, in some classical painting, some pious person, some person who could perform miracles. But a saint was, simply means to be a saint. This word hagios in the Greek simply means to be set apart for a specific purpose, which Paul will make clear what that specific purpose is in his letter. But notice, there's also a st something he says here at the end of verse 1. Being a saint is also someone who has been faithful in Christ Jesus. Someone who's been walking according to the way that, that he walked. The second part of this introduction in verse 2 has Paul's classic greeting of grace and peace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Which, if you know Paul, that's like at every single one of his letters. Grace and peace, grace and peace. The Siamese twins of the New Testament, as they're sometimes called. But what's really interesting about that is... What Paul is doing here is he's actually bringing the church together when he says grace and peace. Grace, the Greek word charis, actually comes from a Greek, a Gentile greeting that most, most uh, Gentiles would say. Kind of, uh, basically they would say rejoice to someone. You know, hey, rejoice, nice to see you. Um, in our English language it sounds weird, but in their Greek language, that's how they would do it. So this word grace actually comes from that word word charis, and then the word peace was actually a classic Jewish greeting. Shalom. Peace. Peace be with you. Ah, nice to see you. Peace to you. And when someone leaves, peace to you. So what Paul is doing is he's actually bringing the Gentile world and the Jewish world together and uniting them right there. Grace and peace. And these things we know as believers can only come from Jesus Christ himself. And so Paul, just starting his letter, I mean... Um, we can already see that the, the amount of stuff packed into just the, the hello from Paul. You know, it's like when someone says hello to you and later on you're like, I think there was a deeper meaning be behind that hello. You know, what did they really mean when they said goodbye or hello? Well, Paul's got a lot to mean when he uh, says it here. Then in verse 3 of Ephesians 1, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So Paul begins his letter after greeting them, saying who he is, who they are, bringing them together under the banner of Christ. He begins his letter by praising the Lord for all he has done, for all who believe, which is really the basis of the first three chapters of this letter. He's simply just going to... Um, yeah, I, I personally, I work at a credit union, a credit union bank. I'm a teller. And so people will call up or people will come in and they kind of want a summary of their accounts. Hey, what's in my savings? What's in my checking? What's, what do I still owe on my loan? What, what's in my certificate? What's in uh, my IRA? What's over here? That's essentially what Paul is, Paul is doing for us as believers. He's giving us a chart of accounts. This is what's in our bank account spiritually. And you'll notice when you get to the loan section that it's been paid off, by the way. But he's just going to sit here and praise the Lord for all the blessings that he's given us. And especially in these first 14 verses, I mean, Paul kind of just uh, breaks out in a song. Kind of breaks out praising the Lord. It's actually very, it, it's, a, it's um, an amplified version of essentially Jesus' prayer and the Lord's prayer. When he says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Paul is taking that and he's expanding it. Because what Jesus was doing when he would begin that prayer is he's actually praising the Lord for who God is 
who his father is and what he has done and he's wanting his will to be done on this earth. And that's what Paul's going to do here. And so he praises Jesus for all the amazing gifts that he's bestowed on us. And um, he's going to, the next verses, he's going to tell us exactly what those are. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. Now these verses, these verses burst, I, I really, when you read them over and over and over again, you'll see that they burst with such an amazing doctrine um, that often has been hijacked or the total opposite has been thrown out completely. And that's the doctrine of, of uh, predestination, the doctrine of election. See, there are some who would read these verses and try to explain it away and say, well, that's not what Paul meant. That's not what the Bible... The Bible doesn't teach that. That's a copyist error or, you know, you're, you're, that's not what he meant. And then there are others who read it and they try and make it about themselves. And actually, in both cases, whether they're hijacking it or throwing it out, they're really doing that. They're making it about themselves. For those of you who are kind of unaware about the doctrine of election, it, it, as Paul says here, is that before time, before the world was formed, he chose us to be adopted as his sons and daughters. And some people, they, they just hold on to that and they either say, well, that sounds crazy. God, God, God wouldn't do that because it's about me and if I choose to believe or if I do this or that, um, but the Bible clearly states that we cannot come to Him, or we cannot call out to Him unless He's first called out to us. And because sometimes we don't understand it, we just try and understand it. And what we're doing is we're making this doctrine about ourselves, rather, well, who it's really supposed to be about, about the Lord. And that's what Paul is doing here. People love to use Paul and twist his words and say, well, this is what he meant. No, Paul is simply praising the Lord for what he has done. But see, when people throw out the doctrine of election, what they're saying is their salvation is completely based on them. And then there are those who, who basically worship the doctrine of election rather than worshiping the God behind it and, and love the fact that they're elected and others aren't. And so again, they're making it about themselves. When you read these verses, you see you see who the who the main character in this doctrine is. It's Jesus. It's not us. We're byproducts of that. We're benefactors of it. When we read it in context, we can see that God chose us before the foundation of the world to be as adopted. And actually, most of your Bibles it'll just say sons, but. In the Greek, it actually talks about adult sons and daughters. And that's important because in, in, their, in this day and age, you could not inherit, an, you, cannot, you could actually inherit um, your fa just like uh, your father's stuff when you were a, a, an adult, not a child. You kind of saw that in the story with the prodigal son. But Paul explains that he actually did this. Paul explains that Christ, that God, chose us before the foundation of the world for three reasons. He lists them out. And, and notice, it has nothing to do with us. It's because of His love, according to the good pleasure of His will, and for His glory. So tell, tell me, do you see your name in there at all? Do you see me, I, you, I just see God. I mean, especially if He did it before we were even created. There's nothing that we had done. In fact, Paul will say that in Ephesians 2. That in Ephesians 2, that is like the foundation of what he's saying there. That it is by grace you have been saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's, it has nothing to do with us. It has all to do with the Lord.
And he also, Paul also puts a stipulation though at the end of, in verse 4 on this doctrine, to this doctrine of election. Because there are some who say, well, if, if there's a doctrine of election, if, 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 uh, if God has elected before time who is to be saved, or you know, who He has chosen and who He has not, well, how am I know if I'm the chosen one? I don't get a letter in the mail. I don't get a card. Paul says that we must be in Him, in Christ Jesus. So I, can, I, I can ask you right now, if you're saved this morning, you're chosen. If you're not saved, you're not chosen, but you can be. But again, don't make it about you. Don't turn the doctrines in the Lord about you. Make it about Him. For His glory. That's why He did it. And being found in Jesus, in Him, is something we'll see is very important in the letter of Ephesians. And so when you come across this doctrine of election and predestination, which is clearly taught in the Bible, and, and we're never going to fully grasp it. I'll tell you, uh, scholars have written thousands and millions of books on it, for it and against it, in the middle of it. And, and they take sides instead of just praising the Lord that He chose us in the first place. Praising the Lord that He gave us the ability to call out to Him. Because the Bible also clearly states that we must believe in order to be saved. But we can't do that unless He's first called us. And you can sit there and try and let that thing stew, but it'll boil over. It, you, you won't figure it out. But I can tell you this, if you, if you want to make sure you're one of the elect, just be found in Him. And the only way to do that, and the only way to come to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. I'm going to point this out every time it says it. But in Him. This is so important. If, you, if you're a, someone who likes to underline in your Bible, circle, box, write in the margins... Right, circle, underline. I usually don't tell you that kind of stuff, but this is so important. In Him. In Him. Because what He's about to list, that's the stipulation for what He's about to list. You know, it's just like when, when you see the TV commercials and it says, you know, get 0% financing for 36 months. And you call up and you say, I'd like to get that, 36 months. You know, months, zero percent financing. Well, the only way to do that is to be found in an A plus credit score. <laughs> these things that Paul is about to list, if we forget that it's in him these things are found, then we'll be misled. See, Paul is continuing to praise the Lord for saving us according to his will, what he wanted for his glory. And again, salvation is not about Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I started reading my notes ahead. But Paul here in verse 7 says that we have, been, we have redemption through His blood. We have redeem, been redeemed by His blood. That we are held ransom. We were held ransom by sin and death, by the prince of the power of the air, Satan, and, the, and only the most costly thing could do it to ransom us from it. In Him we have redemption. He's redeemed us. But He hasn't just taken us from bondage. He hasn't just said, okay, I saved you from Satan. Go on now. But He continues and says that He's forgiven us our sins. The forgiveness of sins. So we were who in bondage to sin and we willingly put ourselves there. And then He comes in and redeems us. If you have, um, if you ever had to like, uh, you know, from like a pet or a child, I've read that like they get in, into a, um, like they get their head stuck in the, uh, in between like the bars of a, of a gate or something. 
And it's their own fault, right? But you go in and you, you take them out and you save them. And Jesus didn't just do that, but he also forgave us of our sins. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. He's thrown them into the sea, never to be remembered anymore. Never to be counted against us. But why did he do this? Not because we're so great, but it's because of the riches of his grace, his unmerited favor towards us. Again, it has nothing to do with... We've done nothing. We've gotten ourselves in the situation Christ has gotten us out of it. Verse 8. Which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Him. Now in verse 8, again, most of your Bibles probably say abound, right? Really, that doesn't do the word justice. Kenneth Wiest, I've quoted him before, he's a Greek scholar. He translates this word abound to super abound. I think you created a word, and it's actually now my, my new favorite word, super abound. So in verse 8, he reads it as, which he made to superabound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. What it means is that God gives us more than an abundance. And we know what abundance is. God's beyond that. God gives us more than that. It gives us more than we could ask or think or possibly imagine. I mean, think about the story of, of uh, Solomon. And God asked Solomon, Hey, Solomon, what do you, one thing, what do you want? What would you like? And instead of asking for riches or honor or strength or beauty or anything like that, he asked for wisdom. He says, uh, how, how is a man supposed to govern your people, Lord? Give me wisdom to do it. And God doesn't just say, okay, well, that's what you asked for, so that's all you're going to get. We kind of have this, because, and it really comes from taking this verse out of context. But, you know, you have not because you ask not. God's not up in heaven sitting there waiting for us to ask. Well, they're not going to ask for it, so I'm not going to give it to them. They need to figure out what they need first before I give it to them. God, I mean, that's a cruel father. Nobody gives us more in abundance of what we've even asked or thought. For Solomon, when he asked for wisdom, God said, well, because you haven't asked for riches and honor and all these things, I'm going to give you wisdom and you'll be the wisest man on earth. But not only that, I'm going to give you riches and honor and all these things. Solomon didn't ask for him, but God still gave it to him. None of us asked for Christ to come on the cross and die for our sins. Yet God sent His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In fact, when His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, came on the earth, we actually told Him to go, go away. Go back. We don't need you. We don't want you. Christ still went to the cross. So Paul is saying, the stuff that God has given us super abounds. It's really more than, than what we think we need. To be quite honest, sometimes when I'm praying for people, I'll, you know, I, I might want to formulate this great prayer of the things I think they need. Lord, I, they're going to need strength. They're going to need this and that and give them this and that. Sometimes I, I found sometimes the most effective prayers. I say effective because I mean, the Lord is always gracious and, and takes care of His kids. Lord, you know what they need. 
And, and if it was based on what I asked for them, then they'd probably be left in the dust. If what we got was based on just what we asked for, we'd, be, we'd have nothing, right? But by His unmerited favor, He has given us all these things to superabound. See if you can work that word in, into a sentence this week. You know? But he did this so that Paul says, as Paul says in verse 10, he could gather together all things in him. The redemption of all things. Putting all things under his feet. In fact, the, Paul will talk about, talks about this more in the book of Colossians. That all things were made through him, by him, and for him. And in him all things consist and have being. Again, going back to the in him. So verse 11 he says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that he, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him. In him. There's that stipulation again. He ends verse 10 with in him, and he starts verse 11 with in him. Which in the Hebrew, in, in the Hebrew um, for the Hebrews they would understand that. Uh, in fact, in a lot of their poetry, a lot of the things throughout uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll see things are repeated over and over and over again. And it's not because they kept forgetting. You know, well, it is because they kept forgetting. That's one of it. But um, it wasn't because the person writing kept, you know, forgetting that they just said that. It was because they wanted to make sure you, the reader, didn't forget. They wanted to highlight that. It was like, it's like making it in bold, Right? Like when you want to be writing an email to someone, unless it's a professional email, you know, don't do all caps or bold. But if you want to make sure they see this, set, you write it in bold. You write it in all caps. That's what Paul is doing. In him. He's, it's in Jesus Christ. If you don't have them, then all this stuff is not yours. You can't lay claim to it. But again, in him, it says we have an obtained inheritance. He's continuing to praise the Lord for saving us according to His will for His glory. He's, again, showing us that salvation has nothing to do with us. We're just benefactors. And that is where we can get it wrong. See, if salvation were about us, then we would have every right to complain when things don't go our way. If God saved us for us and because of us, any bad thing that happened in our life, we would have every right to complain. Lord, you saved me because of me, because you wanted to bless me, because I'm so good, I'm so great. Then why is this bad thing happening, Lord? It's about me and I don't like it. And then he would have to, he would have to answer to us if it was about us. But when we realize that salvation is for the glory of the Lord, then we can understand our own lives a lot better. And that's not a switch. That's not a, when something wrong happens, all of a sudden we're like, whoop, salvation's not about me, and I'm just going to keep it moving. It, sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's not. And that's okay. But, but Paul is telling him, and, and the Lord is telling us to focus on him. That we have obtained an inheritance according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. And it's all for His glory. Our life is, is to be lived for His glory alone. The praise of His glory alone. Not the praise of our own glory. Not our own legacy. Not our own comfort. But for His glory. And when we understand that, it makes it a lot better. In fact, we see it, and I hate to kind of dumb it down like this, but we see it a lot in sports. If you, if you watch any, any, any team sport, right? you don't have to be a... a, a I hope, I hope you, don't, you, know, you don't have to know all this, but any team sport, anyone who's ever played team sports knows that if there's one person on the team that's just in it for themselves, the whole team suffers. The team will never accomplish what it's supposed to.
But when we realize, hey, it's, it's not about us, me personally. It's about the team. Or in, in, in our case, it's about the glory of the Lord and, and the glory of, of His name. Well, that, that changes how you, how you act in this life, how you live in this life. Verse 13, he says, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Again, in Him. In Him you also trusted. He says that we trusted in Christ because of the gospel message we heard, the word of truth. As he also says to the Romans in Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We heard the gospel message. We heard the word of the Lord, and because we heard of that, we believed. Again, not our own word, not a word that we came up with, not a story that our grandparents came up with, but this is the living Word come down from heaven to earth to us. And as John says at the beginning of his gospel, in the beginning the Word was made flesh and He dwelt among us. That Word was Jesus Christ. Because we've heard from Jesus, we've encountered Jesus, we believed. We trusted the gospel of your salvation. And... And then he says, and, and, and Paul, when Paul writes, he's a very, he, you know, we, a lot of us know Paul was a very smart man. When he writes, he writes with intention. And for those maybe even this morning that were struggling with what we were talking about earlier with the doctrine of election or, or predestination or anything like that, Paul gives you a very comforting fact here. Having believed, in verse 13, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I mean, that right there is one of the best promises in the Bible. That we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When we are saved, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He is our guarantee of salvation. He is the down payment for that which is to come. The glory that we will receive from Him. Again, I, I don't know about you guys. I didn't get a letter in the mail once I, I you know, accept, once I believed in the Lord. I didn't get an email saying, Congrat, thank you for joining the club or we're glad you could join us. Please stay up to date with the emails, you know, anything like that. Make sure to mention that you're a club member to earn your points. No, but what we did receive is the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our seal, a guarantee of our salvation. And that goes for every believer. Every believer has the Holy Spirit inside them. I will say this though, not every believer has the Holy Spirit working through them. There are a lot of Christians who walk around. It's like walking around your house and the the floor is dirty and you have a a vacuum and you're just not using it. You have it. You're just not using it. You're not letting it do what it's supposed to. A lot of us have the Holy Spirit inside of us, but we're not letting Him work in us and through us. That is what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. But he says that all this is done again. He actually, he says it um, twice here in these, from verse 12 to verse 14. At the end of verse 12 he says, to the praise of His glory. And then notice what he says at the end of verse 14. To the praise of His glory. All of this is done. Salvation, election, sealing, grace, mercy, adoption. Everything that He's just listed, the great blessings that the Lord has given us, all of this is done not for us, 
but for the glory of God. For His glory alone. And Paul is, and throughout this letter in Ephesians, Paul is going to show us, he's going to take the mirror off of ourselves in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly guilty of this. If there's a reflection of myself, I'm probably going to look at it. Not because I think I'm so great, but just... Oh. And I think most of you out there are probably the same way. We just like looking at ourselves. When there's a photo, a big group photo, who are we looking for? Ourselves. Right? Paul's going to take our focus off ourselves. Our salvation is not about ourselves. Our life lived for Christ is not about ourselves. But it's about His glory and what He'd like us to do. And he begins this letter, these first 14 verses, this, you know, um, he did it in letter form, which made it kind of nice. It, to be honest, if he were like speaking this to you, it'd be kind of awkward because like, hey, I got something to say to you, and then all of a sudden he breaks out in this praise song to the Lord. Basically, you're like, hey, Paul, I'm, I'm still here. He's like, no, I, I first need to give glory to whom it's due. I mean, we, we see that even in our own culture, um, with sports stars and actors and stuff who are believers, not just you know who. Oh yeah, I got to make sure I thank God that way. I you know I, I don't lose my Twitter followers. Um, but who, who may make it a, a case to give glory to the Lord knowing that He's the one who first deserves praise and honor. And He doesn't do this lightly or flippantly but He does it to lay the foundation for all that's going to be said in the rest of the letter and that it's in Him. In Him. Because as we read the rest of this letter the next the rest of chapter 1 all the way through chapter 3. Again, Paul is going to explain what we have in Christ. But again, there's that, that stipulation. It's in Christ. You can't have these things outside of Christ. You can have shadows and in in, in different things that look like it, but you cannot have the actual things. And then in chapters 4 through 6, he explains well, how, how we should live our life knowing what these riches are knowing how rich we are in the Father. And, and with some of the stuff, in fact, yesterday morning in a men's breakfast, we read Titus chapter 2, which speaks about um, bond servants obeying their masters, not pilfering, not talking back. Um, in our day and age, employees and bosses, that would explain that would, what it would be for. And, and we were sitting around the table just talking about it and, and it all kind of hit us like this is a really hard thing to live out sometimes. But in Christ, it's possible. It's only possible. In Him. And so the question this morning I have for you is are, are you in Him? We always talk about I have Jesus Christ in me, and yes, He's in us, but Paul lays the foundation, makes it very clear. Are you being found in Him? Because in Him is righteousness. In Him is forgiveness of sin, redemption. As he'll say at the beginning of chapter 2, and you He made alive who were dead. See, this is what we used to be in, trespasses and sins. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But now He's made us alive. Life is only found in Christ. Lord, we thank you that you, for your glory alone, have given us this grace, this opportunity, Lord, to be found in you. Lord, we thank you um, for choosing us. When none of us deserve to be chosen. We could probably think of a billion other people you could choose instead of us, Lord. But see, it's not about us, it's about you. We, we just want to praise you for that. Give you the glory. Lord, for saving us, for redeeming us, for giving us forgiveness of sins, for giving us grace, for giving us wisdom, for giving us your Holy Spirit to seal us, that guarantee, that down payment of our salvation. The debt's already been paid. Lord, as we review our chart of accounts for what we have found in you, Lord, 
Help us to encourage, I pray that it would encourage us to live for you and live for your glory, not our own. That we would take our eyes off ourselves and put them on you, the author and finisher of our faith. That we would be found in you. And now, Lord, that we wouldn't look for these other things outside of you. Just as, as you, Paul said in Colossians, that in him, in Jesus Christ, all these things live and move and they consist and have their being, Lord. And that should be the same of us. We should be found in you. And so, Lord, I pray for those of us who, who are believers, Lord, that are in you, but, Lord, maybe we haven't been living that way. Maybe we've been living for our own glory. Or maybe we have the, the Holy Spirit in us, we just haven't been letting the Holy Spirit guide us and empower us, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't leave here today without asking for a fresh filling of your Spirit. The guidance and the wisdom of your Spirit. Lord, I pray for anyone this morning that isn't in you. They've heard the word. They've seen the word, Lord, but they're not found in you. I pray, Lord, as you're calling them, you've called them, Lord, that they would come to know you. They would repent and turn to you, Lord. And we would live our lives for your glory alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen.